Formerly a mostly agrarian society, except for a period of a little over 200 years, from the mid-16th until the mid-18th century, during which it hosted the largest, wealthiest, and militarily strongest empire in Southeast Asia. The Kanbong Empire, the country that is today called Myanmar, but which for most of recent history, until the name was changed in 1989, was called Burma, was conquered by the British after a very expensive, in wealth and human lives, series of conflicts that is today collectively referred to as the Anglo-Burmese Wars. Just after that especially dominant era for the Kanbong Empire, the British began expanding into the region, and these two expansionist nations experienced frictions in what was then British East Indian Company territory. These regions at that point were fairly badly defined. There was a lot of travel and rule across borders, and both troops and refugees regularly flooded from one claimed region into the other, resulting in a lot of false alarms and almost battles. Eventually, though, from 1824 until 1826, the first of three primary conflicts was fought with a British East Indian Company victory. The second main conflict lasted from 1852 until 1878 and stemmed from issues with the treaty that had been signed between these two forces after the previous war. And though the Burmese tried to make nice, the British seemed intent on taking some particularly appealing land with some very valuable resources that was in the neighboring territory. So they forced the issue, won the war, and annexed even more formerly Burmese land, which sparked a revolution in Burma, knocking the then king out of power. The third main conflict in this series of conflicts lasted less than a month in November of 1885, and occurred right as Burma was trying to modernize their military and infrastructure in the hope of holding the British back in future potential incursions. The British, though, accused the Burmese of modernizing so they could help the French, their longtime military and otherwise opposition, in future conflicts against the British, and claimed that the king who stepped in after the aforementioned revolution was a tyrant, and they used that as a casus belli for taking the rest of the country for the British Empire. The British then ruled Burma in its totality as a province of British India from the end of 1885 until 1948, at which point, after a few decades of fairly successful protest movements, followed by separation from British India into a separate colony, followed then by occupation by the Japanese during World War II, one of the leaders from that earlier collection of successful protest movements became a thorn in the side of the British, having run the local Communist Party and the local Socialist Party but also having worked with the occupying Japanese forces, in large part because he was very keen to expel the British. He actually changed sides against the Japanese as soon as the war turned against the Axis powers, and after being a Japanese intelligence officer and the Minister of War for the Japanese-held state of Burma, he aligned his military forces with the Allies against the Axis and successfully negotiated with the Allies in the aftermath of the war for independence from Britain. This leader, a man named Bojak Aung San, went on to be called the father of Myanmar and was also the founder of the Myanmar Armed Forces, the country's military. Aung San was not universally beloved, though, despite his success in maneuvering through what had to be very difficult circumstances and no small number of trade-offs. Many locals did not like his turncoat mentality, and ethnic minorities in the country in particular were not fans of him, his military, or his burgeoning political success. And when it came time to hold the first elections of this new country, the minority-run parties boycotted the election, and Aung San's party thus swept the process, taking every seat for which they ran. Once in official semi-democratic power, Aung San's party seemed to try to get the boycotters involved, 
filling his cabinet with representatives from all of the major ethnic and religious groups in the country. Despite that, or perhaps because of it, in mid-1947, soldiers from the Myanmar military, armed with submachine guns and grenades, killed Aung San and several other political leaders of the new country, including members of those formerly resentful minority groups. It's still not 100% clear who orchestrated this assassination. Some theories say that the British were involved, though these claims seem to lack much in the way of evidence and are generally considered to be sensationalized. Other theories orient around the previous prime minister, a man named Toussaint, and I hope I'm pronouncing that even close to correctly. It is spelled U-S-A-W. A man who ran the country during the British Burma era, right before World War II kicked off. And he was hanged for his alleged involvement in this post-World War II assassination. Though again, although there's evidence for this theory that this assassination was conducted at his command or with his involvement, it is still not certain that they punished the right people punished all of the right people, or fully understood why the perpetrators, whoever they were, did what they did. The running theory as to why this assassination took place, though, is that Aung San was planning to build a united front government, including those already in his cabinet from the country's various minority groups, but also the communists that were still somewhat influential in the country, but which had, until that point, been elbowed out to make room for those with more capitalistic leanings. Whatever the truth of this particular killing, more killings and attempted killings of people close to Aung San followed in subsequent years, along with successful assassinations of people involved in the investigation into who committed that original assassination of the country's still new leader, which maybe implies quite a lot, but still tells us very little for certain. What I'd like to talk about today is Myanmar, its more recent history, and a new, tumultuous period that seems to be in the process of unfolding in the region. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, consider becoming a supporter the simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things, but you can find a complete list of ways that you can help support the show, both monetary and non-monetary, at let's know things.com slash support. Great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. I dive further into this episode, a quick note on the naming conventions that I'll be utilizing. Burma was the name of the country I talked about in the intro for generations, and it refers to the home of the Burmese ethnic group, which is the dominant ethnic group in the region. Myanmar was chosen as the new official name for the country in 1989, a year after the military quashed a pro-democracy uprising. It was meant to designate a new beginning of sorts that distanced the reimagined country from its colonial past, but also from other sorts of undesirable aspirations, like, for instance, democracy. Internationally, then, in English, Myanmar is today the official correct name for the country, but locally, folks use both terms, with Myanmar typically being a little more formal, and Burma being the casual way of referring to the country. Almost like saying America instead of the United States of America. I will primarily be using that more common internationally used name then, Myanmar, when referring to this country. But just know that Burma is also acceptable and common, and you may see that name mixed in or used instead when reading about this region in the future, particularly in the United States, because that naming convention has tended to be the more common one in practice for the U.S. government and press. Now that said, the article I'd like to unspool today comes from Reuters, and it's entitled, Myanmar Police 
file charges against Aung San Suu Kyi after coup. Aung San Suu Kyi is the daughter of Bojekt Aung San, the father of Burma that I talked about in the intro, who was assassinated. And like her father, she achieved quite a lot, is renowned within her country, and has been criticized almost as much as she's been celebrated, though generally for different reasons than her father was. Suu Kyi graduated from universities in Delhi and in Oxford, worked at the United Nations for several years, and then in 1988 became the General Secretary of the National League for Democracy, or NLD, a political party that she helped organize that same year, alongside several retired army generals, which aimed to establish a democratic government in the then-military-ruled Myanmar. The NLD and protests that Suu Kyi and this party catalyzed in 1988 pushed the military government to hold elections in 1990. That initial election was meant to form a parliament that would then draft a constitution for the country. So it wasn't to form a permanent government for the country, it was just to make the constitution that would outline the rights of citizens. And the NLD won 392 of the 400. 92 parliamentary seats, while Suu Kyi's efforts resulted in a great deal of international attention for the election and for Myanmar's situation, being ruled by the military on the global stage. Despite the limited powers afforded to these elected officials, however, the government refused to acknowledge their own dramatic loss to this democracy-focused party and continued to rule without anyone else having a say in things until 2011. Shortly before that election took place, Suu Kyi was detained by the military government and put under house arrest. After her party so handedly defeated the government's own candidates, she was kept in confinement under house arrest pretty much continuously until 2010. In aggregate, she was locked away for a total of about 15 of those 21 years which disallowed her from having too much direct influence over local politics, but arguably caused her international celebrity to balloon. She became a very well-known political prisoner, representing in the minds of many the true soul of the country, while a corrupt government did what they could to keep her and her dreams of democracy at bay. In 2010, her party, the NLD, boycotted a new set of elections, considering them to be unfair and farcical. So the Union, Solidarity, and Development Party, which is the outward-facing political wing of the country's military leadership, swept the election, taking about 80% of the contested seats. And as the NLD hoped, this raised alarm bells around the rest of the world, as this was clearly not a legitimate election. In 2012, though, a by-election was held to fill 48 seats in the country's House of Parliament, and the NLD won 43 of the 44 that they tried for, while Suu Kyi herself won a seat in the House of Representatives. And this teed things up for the 2015 general election, during which the NLD won a supermajority of seats in Parliament, 86% of the total available seats. And even though Suu Kyi was officially banned from becoming president because her late husband and children are foreign citizens, she was declared state counselor of Myanmar by the now ruling NLD, which was a position that was created for her and which put her at the top of the government authority pyramid. And that brief summary of recent happenings in the country brings us back to that piece from Reuters. On the first day of February 2021, the Myanmar military leadership conducted a coup against the civilian government of the country, taking Suu Kyi and other people in positions of leadership in the government into custody, before declaring a state of emergency that will last for one year. That state of emergency granting the military extraordinary powers to pretty much do whatever they like, during which time it's assumed they will restructure things in their favor. In the days since this coup was implemented, Myanmar police have said that Suu Kyi was arrested because she had illegal communication equipment in her home, which is a fancy way of saying that she had about 10 walkie-talkies that they are claiming she bought and brought into the country illegally. 
a charge that most international organizations are essentially calling laughable. While other officials, like the president of the country, were arrested according to official charges that were filed against them for violating pandemic protocols while campaigning for office in November. And that campaigning is an important component of this story. This coup, whatever the military press releases might say, came shortly after a November 2020 election in which the military was, to put it lightly, absolutely stomped by the NLD yet again. Analysts who specialize in this area are saying that it seems like the military government had thought that they would do pretty well in this election, but despite having stacked the deck in their favor, restricting some governmental seats for military assignment, and generally, in many foundational ways, restricting the activities of their political opponents and keeping a lot of very important levers of power to themselves, the NLD won 396 of the 476 seats that were being contested, which was an even larger majority than they enjoyed back in 2015. The military's Union Solidarity and Development Party, in contrast, only won 33 seats. After the election, the military declared the results to be fraudulent, a card they'd played before, questioning those previous voting results when they had failed to win the elections. And that's when the military shut down communication systems in the country, locked down the internet and television services, closed banks and other financial services, and closed down airports and other transportation hubs. During this relatively quiet lockdown period, they took the NLD higher-ups into custody, declared that state of emergency, and in the days since have justified their actions with those aforementioned very suspect legal excuses while also continuing to lock certain things down, like Facebook and other social networks. There are several complicating factors that are coloring the reporting of this story, and which also no doubt influenced the decisions the Myanmar military and other involved parties made and are continuing to make. The first is that Suu Kyi and the Myanmar military but her in particular, for reasons I'll get into in just a moment, have been heavily criticized for their lack of significant effective response to what's been described as a genocide against a minority, predominantly Muslim, regional ethnic group called the Rohingya. The military, as I've already mentioned, has continued to hold a great deal of power in Myanmar, even when the country has ostensibly been under the leadership of the NLD. Those election victories absolutely granted more power to the civilian leadership of the country, but the government's infrastructure remained very heavily biased toward military leaders. And if military leaders wanted to do something, there was often seemingly little that even Suu Kyi could do to stop them. That said, Suu Kyi was often called to account for her government's failure to prevent abuses, primarily by the military, but also by normal citizens against this group, including attacks, beatings, sexual violence, and murders. Further, Suu Kyi has several times defended the actions of the military and her people against this minority group, in some cases claiming that she didn't know anything bad was happening to this group, and in other cases flipping the claims around, saying that the violence was necessary. It was a response to this group of Muslims, and Muslims in general, becoming more violent, and in one case, apparently she expressed anger after being interviewed because she was questioned by a BBC reporter who was Muslim and who was asking her questions about this topic. This is a tricky tangle to unravel because while there is a chance that Suu Kyi was either less informed than one would think a country's leader, even if mostly a figurehead leader, would be, or she was aware, but doing what she could, which wasn't much, within a leadership structure in which challenging the actions of the military could cause more damage than it prevented. So maybe she was defending them because she had to. There's also a chance, though, that she just didn't see it as a problem. Maybe she didn't like the Rohingya or Muslims more broadly. And thus, maybe she was party to the violence, rather than just an ignorant or uncaring bystander. It's a difficult pill to swallow for an international community that had heralded her as such a hero, but there's a decent chance that Suu Kyi, while a champion for democracy, is not necessarily a champion for universal 
human rights. Those two things do not necessarily go hand in hand. Either way, Su Chi's international reputation suffered greatly as a consequence of this sequence of revelations, even to the point where there was an ongoing question as to whether she would have the Nobel Peace Prize she received in the 1990s revoked, both for her potential role in what would seem to be an ongoing genocide, or for her government's consistent oppression of and violence toward journalists. All of which complicates a situation that otherwise might seem to be very black and white to some people. Su Chi is still seen by many as a champion for democracy and a liberator of sorts for Myanmar. But there are a lot of gray areas in this story, and her recent narrative paints a less than straightforward picture of who she is and what she stands for, which makes figuring out who to cheer for in this situation a little bit complicated. The second confounding issue in this coup is the global pandemic that, as of the day I'm recording this at least, is ongoing and does not show any evidence of ending, or even being significantly hindered or limited in the near future. This may not immediately seem to intersect with what on its face seems to be a purely military and political issue, but if you look around the world right now, there are many coups and attempted coups taking place, some of them literal, some of them more figurative and careful, and perhaps even taking place within the bounds of existing systems. In all cases, though, during times of great uncertainty and stress and danger and economic and essentially every other type of strain, dramatic shifts become more thinkable, in part because all those unknowns leave many people just wanting stability in any shape, and as such, more of us are willing to accept even certain types of tyranny, as long as that tyranny provides us with an improved sense of security and predictability in our lives. But also partly because a lot of the existing power structures are weakened by these types of uber events, and that provides an opening to those who are willing to take advantage of the vulnerabilities that are revealed in times of great strife and shakeup, the military very well may have made this same move in a non-pandemic world, in other words. Because of how the election shook out, they lost very badly to the NLD, and they may have responded to that in this way, whatever was happening in the broader geopolitical and medical picture. But there's a chance that they felt emboldened by the current state of affairs, in part because they knew it would provide them with cover and the excuse to lock things down for alleged pandemic purposes, and in part because they knew that most of the entities, both internal and external, that might oppose their coup would have their hands full with other things, which as it turns out was probably a decent bet based on the responses that we've been seeing from the international community. Finally, because of the current tensions between Myanmar's main ally and economic benefactor in the region, China, and their main likely opponent in making this move, the US, the UK, the EU, and other such liberal democracies, there's a chance that they saw this moment as being a particularly good one in which to reassert their absolute hold on the country, because there was a decent chance that those international tensions would protect them from the worst outcomes that might otherwise befall them in calmer times. Sanctions on Myanmar and on the country's leadership, for instance, are expected to be passed in those aforementioned democratic countries and multi-country organizations, but there's a good chance that China will make up for those sanctions and perhaps even improve upon Myanmar's economic and diplomatic fortunes in many ways in an effort to further assert their hegemony in the region, not because they approve of or necessarily even like Myanmar, but because providing support for this military government would be inconvenient and maybe even embarrassing for China's geopolitical enemies, and because it could help stabilize one more non-democratic entity in the region, which could bear future fruit for China. Other variables are no doubt at play here as well, including the leader of the military government's apparent desire to retire from the military and lead something akin to a civilian government, and the fact that his chances of doing that, at least in the near future, 
dropped to something near zero after his party's embarrassing loss in that 2020 election. Whatever the fuel and whatever the spark for this move, though, it's likely that the response to it will be slow in playing out, and may even arrive years after the event, as the world collectively pulls itself together and susses out what the new default post-pandemic and post-pandemic-related international restructuring will look like. If you're finding some value in what I'm doing here on Let's Know Things, consider supporting the show. The simplest way to do so is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things, but you can also leave a quick review wherever you get your podcasts, share the show with a friend who you think might enjoy it, share your favorite episode on social media, and there's a collection of other options, both monetary and non-monetary, that you can find at letsknowthings.com slash support. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The course that I'd like to recommend today is a Great Courses course. So I often tend to treat these as something like an audiobook, but a lot of them have video as well, which in some cases is more helpful than others. But this one is called 12 Essential Scientific Concepts. The writer and host of this particular audiobook slash course is named Indre Viscontis, and she's a neuroscientist and an excellent speaker and explainer of core scientific concepts. And that's what the whole course slash audiobook is about. And it doesn't dumb things down in the way that some such courses and books do, but it does provide a nice fundamental explainer, whether you know a great deal about science already, or whether you're looking to just get your feet wet and understand the bare basics so that you can go on to understand more complex topics in the future. If any of that sounds interesting to you, and if you're looking to have somebody who explains these sorts of concepts well in a very compelling way, consider picking up a copy of 12 Essential Scientific Concepts by Indre Viscontis. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcripts for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other podcast, Brain Lenses, at brainlenses.com or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find my week daily news focused newsletter at yesterdaysnewsletter.com, and you can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook, and at Colin is my name on most of the other ones. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.